Hi everyone, welcome back. In our previous lesson, we talked about the use cases of Web3. We saw a good use case and a bad use case. And now at this point, we know what Web3 is, we know its underlying technologies, we know its history, its use cases, and now it's time to understand how it's actually working on the background. So to understand Web3, first we are going to start with an overview of Web2. It's going to be a general overview. We are not going to get into real deep with this overview, but it's going to give you an idea how we are working with Web2 at this point. So when we switch to Web3, we can understand it better once we can compare it with current version. Here, first what we have is, of course, our user Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Jackie goes to web with her browser, let's say, yeah, browser. And then with browser, here we have the internet. What she interacts with the browser is the front end of the application. So here we have our front end. Now, front end is the first thing that we are interacting with as a user. We generally host this front end on a web server. And in fact, whatever we write here is going to be hosted on a web server. So here on top, I'm going to say web server. Then, after the front end, we have our back end. So, back end is the part that where we have the application logic which is separated from the front end. Let's say back end here. After the back end, you may think it's over, but now we actually have a database. So, database is the place that we store the assets and the information about our application. First, we are interacting with the front end. Then front end communicates with the back end for the business logic. Back end actually retrieves data and writes to a database here. And then with the results, it again back to communicates with the front end. And then the result is displayed. And this is the process of Web2 actually. So we have three distinct layers here with the front end and back end. And finally, the database. And let's say database here. Now, let's look at how Web3 is constructed. For the Web3 part, we are going to use the Ethereum example since it's the most generic one. So, Ethereum has four important parts. First, of course, the blockchain. Then, smart contracts. After that, we have EVM. So what's EVM? EVM is Ethereum virtual machine. EVM is actually what executes our smart contract code and it writes to the blockchain. So the state of the blockchain can change. EVM is the middleman here who is doing the work between the Solidity code or any other smart contract code we have and the state changes. The process is done by the EVM, but Ethereum virtual machine cannot understand high level language like Solidity or Viper or any other smart contract language. It can only understand bytecode. Ethereum virtual machine to process our information, first we need to convert it to bytes. Then it's going to execute our process and whatever result we have is going to alter the state of the blockchain with that result. And finally, we have the front end part which is the same from before. Now, let's look at the architecture of Web3. Again here, we know who we have with the longer hair, we have Jackie. Jackie goes to web with her browser, let's say web browser here, and we have the internet here. So far, it's the same. And actually, we have our front end here, Even this part is the same, and this front end hosted in a web server. Next, we have the Ethereum blockchain. Let's make this for Ethereum blockchain. Let's say we have this area because we have multiple components inside this Ethereum blockchain.
This is our Ethereum blockchain. We have EVM as we talk. So let's say EVM here. And here we have our blocks. As we said, EVM executes our smart contract and whatever result we have, it alters the blocks with that result. So here EVM is going to communicate with these blocks. But also we are going to have our smart contracts. Let's say smart contracts. And this smart contract is going to be executed by Ethereum virtual machine. And that is going to alter the state of the blocks. Hence, we will be able to alter the state of the blockchain using the smart contracts. And that will be the part of the Ethereum blockchain. In the previous example, we said that we are going to communicate with the backend and we just drew an arrow and it was simple as like that. But in this situation, our frontend cannot directly talk with this Ethereum blockchain because it's a decentralized and closed system. What we can do here is that since we have a lot of nodes in this Ethereum blockchain, we can communicate with one of those nodes, one of those providers. Since the same information is duplicated in every node in the Ethereum blockchain, then we can use any providers that we want. One of the most popular providers are Alchemy and Infera. In our situation, let's say we have our provider here. So with the front end, we are communicating with the provider and we are actually changing data on the blockchain or retrieving data from the blockchain. Here, even though it looks like we have an okay structure, in most cases, we don't want to put our assets on the blockchain since they may be too costly. So we can have a decentralized solution here like IPFS. And for the IPFS, again, we are going to use a provider and we are also going to connect it with our front end. Let's look at our process again. We have our Jackie who is in the web browser interacting with the front end and through the provider, she can actually interact with the blockchain application on Ethereum. We need an authentication process to actually alter the state of the blockchain. And for that, she needs to sign transaction with her key. And for that, we need a signer. One of the most popular signers for Ethereum blockchain that you may heard is MetaMask. So let's say signer here. And web browser, front end is going to communicate with the signer. So the signer generally is a browser extension and it holds the data on the browser. So when the website needs to sign some transaction, uh, the extension comes into play. It just provides the necessary information. It's the middleman here. Then we can sign our transaction. Now we have one last thing. Ethereum is not optimized. It cannot scale very nice for any application that we want to develop. So some applications that need other processes because like when we scale Ethereum, we can see that our application gets costier and costier by its usage. So we may need a layer two scaling option. So what does it mean? A layer two scaling option is another chain which actually does the work in a more efficient, more optimized and a faster way. And then it interacts with the Ethereum blockchain for us. And we can actually use this layer two solution which acts as a booster. So the hard part is actually the transactions. Processing transactions take the most of the time. And we are using this layer two scaling solutions for that work. So we are actually optimizing the hardest part. And then we are writing this data to the Ethereum blockchain, which is the easier part so that we can have a faster and more efficient way of interacting with the blockchain. It's not good always. So sometimes we may need to directly communicate with the layer one, and sometimes we may need to directly communicate with the layer two. So it depends on the project and your needs, but in this situation, we need to add this uh, to the architecture. So let's say layer two here, layer two solutions, And one of the most popular one is Polygon. 
um, ZQ rollups and so on. And we are going to connect this with our Ethereum blockchain and also with our front end. Even though it looks a little bit complicated, let's have a walk through so we can understand it in a better way. So let's start with Jackie. Jackie goes to the browser. She's using a decentralized application. She's interacting with the front end and through the provider, she's interacting with the blockchain. She needs to retrieve some data through the front end. She goes to the provider. The provider communicates with the Ethereum blockchain. Provider gets data, then we get the data back through the provider. Then she wants to change something on the blockchain. And for that matter, she needs to sign the transaction through the browser and with the front end using the signer, she is actually signing the transaction. And through the provider, we are changing the state of the Ethereum blockchain, and then we get the result back. And for another application, the centralized application where she is using layer two, and here, what we are doing is through the front end and with the help of, of course, provider, she's actually connecting with layer two. And then through the layer two, she's interacting with the blockchain. And we are actually boosting up the process in this layer two. What we have is actually a simpler structure here. Since we are getting into more details, it looks a little bit more complicated. But let's have a side by side here. Let's say for the web two. What we have is a front end, back end, and a database. And for the Web3, what we have is our front end, and then we have our blockchain. This blockchain here has the backend logic of our application, but at the same time, it is our database. With Web3, we have this backend and database at the same time with our blockchain. So we are actually working with one infrastructure, not a separate two infrastructure connected to each other. So in a general sense, we can see that it's not actually much more complicated than MEP2. Of course, since it's new, there are many little solutions for many little different things. But as time goes by, I believe that it's going to be much more easier to develop applications in Web3 and also use Web3. This is how Web3 is working under the hood. Don't worry. While we are developing smart contracts, a lot of this complication has been isolated from us. Imagine when you are developing applications in Web2, you actually don't consider a lot of things on the background. So you are just focusing on your application and its efficiency. And that's what we are doing in Web3. It's actually even more complicated than our current technology, which is Web2. You will not be working these complex days anyways. Thank you very much for listening to me on this video. That's the end of this one. And I will see you on the next one.